we're going to jump right into our sermon. Um, we are going over Romans chapter 5 today. So if you have your Bibles or if you've got your electronic Bibles, uh, if you need an electronic Bible, it's free to download the church app. Just go to your store, your app store, and, and search for Prayer House Church as three words. You can download our app for free. Within that app, there's information about the church and about activities going on, but there's also a free Bible app, and it's got all the versions. You can cross-reference. You can do interlinear. A lot of different amazing stuff within that. Uh, so if you need that, please download that. Feel free. We do have free Wi-Fi for TWC. If you link, click on the TWC Wi-Fi, you can get on for free for an hour. All right, amen. Well, let's let's jump into the Word before we do. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we are so grateful. We are so honored, Jesus, that you would take the time to just be with us. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word, that it has something to say to us today. Even though you walked many years ago, you are still walking in our midst today through your word. So we thank you, Jesus, for that. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. In your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. So I already mentioned we're going to be going through Romans chapter 5. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a Bible that you're comfortable making notes in, you can look at the first 1 through 5, that first section of Scripture, and you can look at that as faith triumphs. That's kind of the message of that first five verses, is that faith triumphs. Then the next section of verses, 6 through 11, that's where righteousness is declared and we are made reconciled to God. So that's kind of the what's being talked about in that section. And then the final section of 12 through 21, it's death through Adam and life through Christ. And it kind of just gives a breakdown of what all this means and what salvation means. However, I do want to I do want to kind of clear some things up about the book of Romans before we jump into it. Uh, we're only going to be looking at the first five verses today. So don't worry. It's not going to be a full on Bible you know, study, but. We're going to go into it. First five verses. There's some really good things that I want to pull out there. But the book of Romans as a whole, how we can understand it when we're reading it as believers, the book of Romans is primarily, it's a document of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? The book of Romans is there to explain it. There's no other writing in the New Testament that deals with the subject of salvation more fully or more completely or more in depth. Uh, it's also a document that's written for the church specifically. This is written to believers, for believers, and by a believer. But that means, um, I, so I, I want to jump out of that a little bit. If someone comes up to you and says, what does it mean to be saved? Don't just go, oh, well, the book of Romans talks about salvation. Read the book of Romans. No, live out salvation so that they first see it. And then once they come to believe, they can understand it in a deeper way by reading the book of Romans. Amen? Everybody with me on that? After explaining what repentance means, what, what confessing of sin means, what repentance to Jesus means, then you can walk through with them through the book of Romans to get a more clear understanding. The book of Romans is never, it's never was or will be intended to replace the the, the personal example that we as believers are to live out. In fact, it, it calls us to live that out in a deeper way. Live out the influence of the Bible. Don't just tell people to read the Bible. It's good for people to read the Bible, sure. But live it out. This is alive. This is a living testimony of what God has done. Live out the book of Romans. Now, just to clear up some things about Paul, he was born a... Jew, <laughs> but he was also Greek through his life experiences and the time he spent in Tarsus, as well as he was a Roman citizen. So this guy was kind of the best of everything, but he was completely Christ's man. I want you to understand that. A lot of talk right now, it's very popular to have diversity and to have intercultural experiences, but when you are in Christ, you are Christian. You are in Christ. Everything else is secondary. It doesn't matter who you were born as, what color you were born as, or what color you want to be, or what sex you were born, or what sex you really think you should be. 
All of that is secondary when you come to Christ. When you come to faith in Jesus, you are Christian. All the other stuff, out the window because it doesn't matter. Because we're all the same in Christ. So as Christians, we don't need to look to be diverse in the sense of, oh, I have to be a little in this area and I have to be a part of that group and I need to be a part of this social movement. No, be about Christ. And all the other stuff will make sense after that. Live out the influence of the Bible. So Paul, he was he was a Jew, he was Greek, and he was Roman. See, Paul was trained by the Jews. And it was with this Jewish filter that he interpreted all of humanity around him. Viewing the Gentile world, when he specifically looked to the Gentiles, his outlook, his understanding of what he was experiencing by watching these Gentiles, it was... It was uh, you can tell by his readings that he was overwhelmed by this sense of disaster. Look at these Gentiles, the sinfulness. This is a disaster. But he wrote with faith. He wrote with hope because he knew the remedy that was found in the grace of God. Amen? He did not minimize sin. You can look, you can look at his earlier writings. You can look at the whole writings of his message. He made much of, brought a lot of attention to sin but a lot of attention to sin because God has something that's greater than your sinfulness. He has your grace. He has grace that is added to you. He looked with fearless eyes into the darkness of the world, but he looked upon it with the eyes that were lit with hope because he knew God's remedy for sin was full and it was sufficient for the day he was in. Referring to the Gentile world, he said that uh, he had been, or he said that they had been disobedient to the light, holding down the truth in unrighteousness. Right? So we don't have to look very far to see unrighteousness. We don't have to look very far to see people who knew and know what they should do, but they choose not to do it. Right? Do we have to look far? Oftentimes we just have to look in the mirror. Right? Can I get an amen? Are you sleeping? All right. So yeah. We don't have to look very far to see that there are people that are uh, suppressing the truth and replacing it with a lie. That's what we do as, as sinful humans. But he looked upon the Jewish race. Now, right, so the Jews were the ones that contained the, the truth of God. The scripture came to them first, and then they were to go and spread it. So he looked to the Jews with a, a further sense of they should know what they're doing. They should know right from wrong. But he finally he summarized the Jewish way as he declared that the whole world was guilty before God. Doesn't matter if you were Jew, doesn't matter if you were Gentile, the whole world was guilty before God. Romans 3 9. What then? Are we any better? Speaking of the Jews here, not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jew and Gentile are all under sin. This levels the playing field. Doesn't matter if you're white, black, and any other color, any other nationality, any other gender, we're all under sin. So we're all on a level playing field at this point. Now we all have the same need for the same salvation, the same hope that's found in Jesus. The purpose of Romans is to explain the provision made for the world, and that provision is Christ. Paul wrote with conviction. That the only solution for the problem of sin is found in Jesus. Nothing else, nothing else can take away sin but Jesus. He wrote that outside of a relationship with Jesus, there could be no hope for a newness of life. Paul wrote to show the provision of grace is revealed in a threefold movement. First, you've got justification, then you've got sanctification. And you have glorification. Now the chapter we're looking at, chapter 5, it deals specifically with justification. Now there's a great question. And that's, how could, how could it be possible for God to be just and yet lovingly justify the guilty? Who's the guilty? Us. So how could a loving, or how could a just God, someone who is is all about his ways, his his dealings, his his laws, his order. 
how could someone who stands for that kind of holiness justify us sinners? And that's what Romans 5 deals with. It is utterly impossible for any earthly judge or jury to justify the guilty without violating justice. Have you ever been uh, a part of uh, a jury? Have you ever been subpoenaed to court? You have to go and be part of a jury? Yes, most of us. Some of us haven't, but some of us have. Can you think of a possible situation where you can be on the jury and the charge is brought before you to just or make decisions wisely according to the law? And you found that man, that woman, to be completely guilty. I mean, all evidence, everything points to. He did it. And then can you imagine being the jury and the judge say, I find this man guilty, but I'm setting him free without any recourse or any time served. We would, we would get that judge out of there, right? We wouldn't have any. This is an unjust judge. This is not a judge who is upholding the law, but he's setting captives free. Can you imagine a judge like that? Yet this is how the gospel portrays God. God does just that. He found all of humanity to be guilty. There was not even one person in the whole of humanity or whoever had been and whoever will come. There was not one person naturally born that was innocent. That was pure. That was that was in, in himself completely just. Everyone had broken the law. He found that everyone had in some way or another given themselves over to sinfulness and openly rejected God's ways. This is how he has found humanity. The judgment for such behavior is... Yeah, you don't have to be ashamed to say it. There you go. Dave, gold star for you. Give him a good one. Death. Death is the judgment of God upon the sinful. And it's not just physical death. It's eternal death. It's eternal separation from him. You know, a lot of people in our culture, they, they, would, they would pipe up to that point and say, well, that's just not fair. How, that's not fair. How could a loving God, like is depicted in the Bible... How could a loving God send people to hell? That's not justice. That's not fairness. Right? You've ever heard that? How could God send anybody? I'm a good person. I don't I don't lie all the time. I don't steal when people are looking. I don't break the law. Right? How could a loving God send people to hell? I always respond to them by saying, God doesn't send people to hell. You know what? God doesn't send anyone to hell. We send ourselves. How do we do that? We send ourselves to hell by knowing the way out of hell, the escape of hell, and choosing not to accept it. It's kind of like this road is a dead end because at the end of this road you're dead because you're going off a cliff. So stop, break, go the other way. And we don't choose to stop, break, go the other way. We choose to drive off the cliff. We know our outcome. We know our fate. And yet, our obstinate, arrogant attitude and our selfishness and our sinfulness says, no, we can do it our way and we can still reap the reward of heaven. Sorry, folks. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Just, it's easier to accept it than to refute it. God provided an escape and we either accept his free gift of grace or we reject it. There's no two ways about it. In Romans 3, 24, it says, They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Okay, so God made, God made a way through Jesus. That's, that's great. But what about the man and the woman who are far removed from the time that Jesus walked the earth? What about the guys who are far from seeing the crucifixion, witnessing the resurrection? What about them? That's us today, right? It's been more than 2,000 years. What about us today? How can this be accredited to us? How can this grace, this mercy that the Bible so freely uh, talks about, how is that available to us today? It's answered in Ephesians 2.8. By faith. Faith in who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. 
faith in Jesus Christ. It says, for you are saved by faith or by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. You know, I, I like to pose the question to somebody who says, well, that's not fair. How could God send people to hell? I always ask him, did you create yourself? Like, did you muster up your own desire to be born? So the answer always no. Well, if you didn't do that and you were born out of your own control into a system that you don't control, and then you're going to sit there and try to argue with the rules? I mean, does anybody else see it that way, or am I, am I alone here? Yeah, you didn't create yourself. You were born into a system that God has made, that God has set. And then we're going to rebel against that system as if we are the ones who create the law? It just kind of points out the, the uh, ignorance, doesn't it? So it's by faith, through this grace, or by grace through the faith that we have been saved. Now that brings us into this chapter that we're looking at. Now the first 11 verses explain to us believers from the individual standpoint, using pronouns like we and us. Let's just quickly quickly go through 111. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that we or that they are good for us. They help us learn to endure. And endurance develops strength through character in us, and character strengthens our confidence and expectations of salvation, and this ex this expectation will not disappoint who? Us. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we, we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now no one is likely to die for a uh, uh, now no one is likely to die for a good person though sometimes someone might be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God has showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while who was still a sinner? We were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will continually save us from God's judgment. For since we were restored to friendship with God by the death of his son, while we uh, were still his enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, making us friends of God. How many times there does it talk about we and us? This is to the believer. This is to somebody who has accepted the grace of God, who knows the relationship of, of God. Looking quickly at verse 1, going back a little bit. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul was doing here, what he did in, is, is the same as what he did in other occasions. In other writings where he is urging the necessity for the believers to act upon the blessings that they have freely been given. God accounted it to them to act in a way that they couldn't on their own do. But when that relationship came, they were free to act and respond according to that. Paul is encouraging believers to have peace with God. How many people, looking at today's society, watching the news, how many people just desire peace? They're just looking for peace. They're trying to gain peace. They're trying to legislate peace. Peace, peace, peace. All this is done in the name of peace. Everybody's looking for peace. But Paul is encouraging believers to 
have peace with God because God's made peace with him available. We don't have to seek it out or earn it or try to, to have it rewarded to us in some way. God has already done that to us, for us, and by us, we can experience his peace. He is trying to get us to see that peace with God is not something we need to earn, to strive, but that we can live. To live in peace is a privilege, isn't it? I mean, everybody wants to live in peace. Who wants to live in chaos? Nobody. Everybody wants to live in peace. But it's a privilege of the believer that it is possible for you to live in peace with God. Now, do all people everywhere live in peace? No. We see it all around us. We see it in ourselves. We see it in our neighbors. So not all believers live in peace. But can they? According to what's been done for them, can they? It's available to all believers to live in peace. So the question is, why don't they when it has been privileged to them? to be able to do so. What's getting in the way? How come peace isn't a part of every believer's life? Now we're only talking about people who have accepted the Lord, right? So how come there's strife? How come there's envy? How come there's backstabbing? How come there's murmuring? How come there's gossip? If we have the peace available to us, why are we rejecting that? Why not take advantage of that privilege? And my prayer for all of us is that we all live according to the privilege that has been created for us, that we live in peace. You see, when you have peace with God, a natural byproduct will be peace with man. Does that make sense? When you have a right relationship with God, you are going to see and interpret other people in the way that he sees them. You are going to love them in the same way that you've been loved. So that... If you struggle to live in peace with your fellow man, you are struggling really to live in peace with God in some way. This, this usually means that you are not willing to explore and find out the reason why you're not living in peace. Why are you so bitter? Why are you so frustrated with your circumstances, with your situation? I would encourage you to start thinking about who is the center of your story. Who's the main character of your story? Right? It's kind of a it's kind of a trick question because I say your story. But if there was to be a book written about your life, or I should say this life that you're living, who's the main character? I guarantee you if you're the main character of your story, you're not living in peace with the man and woman next to you. But if God is the center of your story, and if everything, every line that is written about that book or in that book, if God is at the center, you're going to have peace with mankind. Because God made peace available to everyone. Everything begins with the fact stated in verse 1. Since we have been justified by faith. If you have no faith in God, you have an empty pursuit for peace and will never find true fulfillment outside of Him. You're never going to find peace outside of God. True, lasting peace. You may find an emotional high. You may find something that satisfies the flesh for a time. You may even find a loving relationship until you do something wrong. And it turns from love into a hate relationship that you're bound to and that you feel like you can't get out of. But without a pursuit of God, you are never going to have true peace, true lasting peace. Verse 1 begins to answer the question of how can God be just and still justify a sinner? You see, God can be just and justify the sinner in the same way a sinner can be received by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus made the way for God to remain just and for sinners to find repentance. So with all of that said, as believers, we now have the responsibility to be true to the privilege of the grace we have freely experienced through Jesus. I want to point out 
that there, there are two main privileges implicated here. There's two main uh, privileges that are stated here. The first privilege is that of access into grace. As believers, we have access into this grace that has been so freely poured out. It's not, it's not that, okay, I, I've said the sinner's prayer, I've, I've come to the altar, I've talked with the pastor, and now I have to go out and try to earn some more grace, right? Like, I have to try to live a certain way, I have to try to do these things, not that you shouldn't live a certain way, and not that you shouldn't do certain things, but don't do that in trying to gain grace, like you're trying to earn it. Don't do it because you've earned it. Do it as a, a response to the loving grace that he has given you. Live according to the grace by which you've been called. Amen? Jesus made the way for God to remain just and for you and me, a sinner, to find repentance. And that is through grace. The second privilege is the privilege of the hope of glory. We, as believers, we have the hope of glory. The responsibility following them, these two uh, privileges, is that it is because of Jesus we now have access into grace, and as a result, we now have peace with God. It is because of grace that we rejoice in the hope of glory. Having access into grace, we find everything covered with the radiant light of glory. This is what salvation really means. If you're trying to sum up and, and define what salvation is, it's being able to walk in victory. Salvation is a mindset that doesn't get bound by what I can't do, but says everything is possible because of Jesus. Everything is possible now through faith. It's no longer, well, the situation has me in this kind of a bondage, or my situation, what people have done to me, has me in this type of a situation that I can't escape. No. It says, hey, you know what? The world's trying to keep me down, ultimately, the devil. But God is going to provide a way through my faith and my understanding that he is faithful, and I'm going to get out of this. You know, we've been talking about grace, that word grace, a lot, and it's here used with all the fullness that we understand the aspect of grace to be, but specifically this aspect of favor. Grace is unmerited favor. Am I theologically correct, Brian? That's right. Bible College confirms. Grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited. We, we didn't do anything to earn it. It's unmerited. Favor is that God chose to be kind to us when he would have been fully justified to hold us to our crimes. But he had a sinner before him. He had somebody fully condemned before him. And he chose grace. Through the redemption that is Jesus Christ and by faith, we have access into this realm of divine favor. Because of Jesus, we stand no longer as beggars outside, but we are now admitted into the closest and most intimate relationship with God. To stand in Divine favor is to live in the kingdom of all perfection and beauty. Something that everybody wants, right? We want to know what ultimate perfection and beauty is. That's what it means to have divine favor. As believers, we are brought into the realm of the hope of glory. This is something that's not available, really, to those who have not accepted Christ. It's not available to them, but the moment they accept grace, a flood of everything is poured out. As a believer, you don't need to earn anything because it was all given to you. But before you believed, you're striving. You're working your fingers to the bone just trying to make it. Just trying to earn something. You're trying to, you're trying to uh, achieve a state of life that's only available through the grace of God. But as believers, we are brought into the realm of the hope of glory. Although that is included, but um, this, this, uh, well, let me back up to verse 2. Verse 2 says, we rejoice in the hope of glory of God. This means 
far more than we rejoice in our own personal glorification, although that is implied and often received through this hope of glory. To be this, the hope of glory is to make God completely glorified. That's what it means by the saying the hope of glory. I have a desire within me to see in every of my situations God glorified. Doesn't matter if I'm up to my neck in bill collectors because I've made poor decisions, but now that I know grace, I have a freedom from all that. He's going to give you the ability to make wise decisions. He's going to give you the understanding to see past your situation. He's going to help you to move forward through the faith that's been given to you by Him. As believers who are maintaining the hope of glory, that believer knows nothing of selfishness. He is consumed fully with Christ being glorified and not himself. Grace. I like to call grace the fire of the divine. Because what does fire do? It burns up or it purifies. It's the fire of the divine. Grace is so awesome. Grace makes beautiful all that it touches. It also burns up the garbage, the things that are out of harmony with the divine nature. I want you to think about this. The next time you're having an argument with your spouse, try displaying a bit of grace. Because in that moment that you try to be graceful, all that trash is going to well up inside of you, and you're like, oh, I could say this. I could totally put her in her place. Oh, I could say this, and he's going to know that I'm right. Oh, all this trash. Well, if you're not going to display grace, go ahead and put on the cleanup crew and speed dial because it's going to be a mess. Grace in that moment is either going to burn up that trash or it's going to burn you up because you're full of trash. <laughs> but the grace of God will help you to uh, display the character of Christ. The character of Christ is love and it's mercy. If you let the trash come out, who are you really trying to glorify? Are you trying to glorify yourself and prove that you're right? Or are you allowing the grace of God to prove and to glorify God? See, as believers who have access into grace, we rejoice in the assurance of the ultimate victory of God and not ourselves. You know, the grace of God does not allow us to be more uh, than we were outside of the grace of God is, it's, here's the awesome thing about grace, is before you come to accept the Lord, there is a measure of grace in your life. There's a measure of grace in your life enough to bring you to the point of realizing that you need grace, that you need his salvation, that you need his favor. But the grace of God, once you become a believer, helps you to be more than a conqueror because you now have everything that is Jesus, and Jesus is the conqueror. So the grace of God makes available the believer's life to be more than conquerors because we are in Him. You know, it's written concerning our Lord Jesus. It says, Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. His joy was through enduring the cross. The prayer that he taught his disciples would be answered when he endured the cross and when this was all finished. That prayer that in the name of God would be hallowed. That, that name that is above all names would be hallowed and be reverenced. That the kingdom of God would come through the endurance of this cross. And that the will of God would be done on earth as it is in heaven when Jesus endured the cross. Sometimes we need to endure some things to receive a greater measure of grace. This leads us into our understanding, to understanding better our privileges as a believer. And I, just real quickly to summarize our privileges. First, we are brought into a place of reconciliation by grace. So here's the charge. Let us live accordingly. It's been given to us, this reconciliation. So why do you strife? 
Why do you have complaints with another brother? Why do you hold God accountable for certain things? You know, people judge God every day. Why? God's made no barrier between God and man. Why don't we live according to the grace that He has given us? It's our privilege. It's our privilege to live in grace. This means that we are to see it, that nothing is permitted to interfere between us and God. You know, I asked the first question, how come believers don't live in grace all the time? Because we're allowing things to come in and get in between us and God. When God has made the path between God and man clear, we're kind of like, yeah, well, you know, boundaries are healthy. Let me put up a little boundary right here. Oh, you know what? Well, I could, I could let that in because it's not going to be a big deal, right? It's just a little thing. Oh, it's just a little something here and there. We, we just start allowing little things to creep in and get in between our relationship with God. And when we do that, our relationship with Him and with the mankind around us suffers. We're allowing things that are not permitted to interfere between us and God. We are as believers to guard against anything that may create any measure of conflict. This shouldn't be a part of a believer's life. And yet we oftentimes invite that stuff in. It's not enough to simply talk about peace with God. It is absolutely necessary to live in peace with God because God has swept away every reason for conflict between God and man. You know, we're, we're always in danger of allowing something to intervene which creates distance. That's why you have to be on guard. Ever be on guard to keep the relationship between you and God healthy and strong. You know, we're doing morning manna, 6 a.m. If you don't have to be to work till 8, perfect. You can grab McDonald's after 7 o'clock. Go to McDonald's. Get your food. Go to work. Wake up an hour and a half early. Get to morning manna. Spend time praying. Spend time in God's presence. It is crucial. If you're in ministry in any sort of way and you're not praying, shame on you. Because you're allowing something to creep into your life and cause a chasm between you and God that was never intended to be there. Protect it. Ensure its success. Now the second privilege is that we can rejoice. So, let us rejoice. As believers, we can rejoice. No matter what's going on, the privilege of having grace would seem to be a great reason to rejoice, wouldn't it? Doesn't that seem like a good thing? We know grace. Shouldn't we always have an attitude that is open to rejoicing? But life has a way of stealing our joy from time to time, doesn't it? You know, when we do funerals, um, it's not always for Christians. It's not always for believers. And you can tell. Uh, a believer's funeral, it's a rejoicing. But for someone who is past that is unsaved, my goodness, it's heavy, it's somber, it's sad, it's often dark, it's just oh, a disappointment. There's a difference in a believer's life and those who are not saved. The privilege of having grace is a great reason to rejoice. However, Paul reminds us that as believers, rejoicing is not merely a privilege, it's a duty. You have the responsibility as a believer to be rejoicing, always. It's perfectly true that to the believer rejoicing, or to the unbeliever, rejoicing seems futile. Especially if there's no God. What, what do I have reason to be happy? I'm just a lump of something moving on a rock of nothing. Right? To an unbeliever. But to the believer, rejoicing is a necessary part of life. 
because we know a hope that we didn't know before. That should be louder. Amen. We have, as believers and unbelievers alike, we have no right to pretend to be joyful if we lack it. Get rid of those fake smiles. Let us mourn with those who mourn, but let us rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen? The smile that is strained is forever in itself a lie and therefore has no value to you or to anyone around you. The value of a sincere smile is found in rejoicing. Rejoicing is only possible when peace is experienced. The point of looking at these responsibilities is that we see the condition of peace is maintained. We see that we maintain this, this peace in our life. Peace makes rejoicing possible. Even if God's peace is maintained and nothing is permitted to break in and create conflict, we still need to experience that sorrow of life. But in spite of the sorrow taking over, that joy is going to well up within a believer's heart. Paul and Silas in a Philippi prison, they knew sorrow. There was nothing in their circumstances to make them joyful. And yet, they were full of joy. How could that be? Even in prison, they were rejoicing in the hope of glory of God. Though their backs were bleeding because they were being whipped and abused, their feet were in stocks. There was no light in the dungeon. And even so, they remained joyful. What did they do? They sang. They rejoiced. Even in prison, where rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, though their backs were bleeding, they remained hopeful. They remained full of praise because of what God has done. They were motivated by peace with God, and so they sang in the night. You know, there's something remarkable to the world that a person, a believer, would be able to rejoice in the face of opposition. It almost sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like, I'm not being whipped, I'm laughing. <laughs> it doesn't seem right in the head. But, it's right in the heart when we know the peace of God. When you know the peace of God that goes beyond your life, it's perfectly acceptable to say, hey, I'm only here for a moment. Last week we heard about the dust. I'm just dust. But when you know the peace of God, there's something much greater, much deeper, much more remote, uh, rewarding than this temporal time. The peace is stronger and deeper than the momentary trial. The perspective and approach to life is unique to Christianity. This peace of God that we know, this fellowship with God, this is unique to Christianity. A lot of other religions, a lot of other philosophies, teachings, they're all striving to attain the peace or nirvana. You've got to strive to it. You've got to, you know, we have the peace of God because it was freely given. Verse 3, Paul says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Who's going through some suffering? Raise your hand. Great. You know why? Because this is going to come to an end. And endurance is coming. Peace of God is going to make a way for prosperity of God to overcome that situation and you will be made stronger. This kind of optimism, this optimistic lifestyle, this optimistic viewpoint, it's only found in Christ. We can find nothing, nothing approaching it in any other realm of human thinking. Have you ever heard this saying? It's on the screens there. What can't be cured must be endured. You ever heard that? No? Oh, you're not old enough yet. Once you hit 30, then. No, but what can't be cured must be endured. I think this is, a, this is what was going through Paul's mind while he was in prison. 
He knew that through the grace of God that he was either going to die, a likely outcome, especially when you're in a dark dungeon with blood and all that other junk in there. You're probably going to get some fatal uh, infection and die. Or this circumstance was going to produce in him a character of Christ that could never be attained outside of it. And he was going to walk out more victorious in his relationship with God than he walked into it with. That's why I said if you're in trial, praise God, because something good is coming. But if you irresponsibly manage the situation and try to glorify yourself, you're going to die. And it's going to be sad. You hear me? Sad. But when God is applied and when the grace of God is understood, it is going to be something worth rejoicing over. The circumstances may be sad in themselves. There may be a divorce, there may be a death, there may be all kinds of there may be abuse, there may be all kinds of different things that are truly in themselves sad. But what comes after that time of trial is great. Either way, whether he died or Paul made it out of prison, he desired to see God glorified, either in his death or in his victory. Christ, Paul was determined that Christ would, see, would receive the praise. The world may not understand why we as believers rejoice. They don't get it yet. They're, uh, we're going through in our evangelism class and we come up with this term of pre-Christian. They're just walking around pre-Christ salvation applied to their life. They are not yet saved until you bring the hope of glory to them. Amen? Megan, could you come on up? So the world may not understand why we as believers rejoice. But we rejoice through our praise. We have discovered the process that cures us. That's why we rejoice. Because we know the one who cures us. We're going through ailments. We're going through sickness. We're going through trials. We're going through circumstances. But we rejoice because we know the one who cures us. This is what Paul then explains in verse 4 and 5. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Do you hear that? This trial, this circumstance that you're going through, it's not designed to put you to shame. It's designed to glorify God. When it's rightly handled, God will receive glory and praise. So he comes back to hope. Paul brings us back to hope. And he is showing us that greater hope is the result of our tribulations when God is applied. So are you going through trials? Has evil, truly evil, has truly been done to you? Have you been thrown into a hellish situation and you're trapped? Are you choosing to rejoice? And in spite of your circumstances, are you choosing to glorify God? God should be glorified regardless of our salvation. He is everything. Just on that basis alone, He deserves our praise because we're created by Him. Have you the opportunity, or I should say, what we're going to do now, I'm going to invite everybody to stand. Worship team's going to lead us in a couple songs. Right now, you have the opportunity to rejoice. You have the opportunity to praise God no matter what's going on. No matter your circumstances, no matter your trials, you have the opportunity to allow the divine fire to purify. And so in our rejoicing, in our praise to God, allow the grace of God to mold you into the image of Christ and less like the image of the lifeless dust that you were created from. Remember verse 5. Remember God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. So ask the Holy Spirit. If you're having a hard time rejoicing, ask the Holy Spirit to bring up that joy that is down deep within you as a believer and if you're not a believer and you want to be come and see me there's some good things waiting for you amen amen so let's let's rejoice together and let's sing his praise Little 
hopeless life. I was blinded by darkness that I could not find.